everyone. Welcome to the Dream Catcher podcast, a place where your dreams can find a voice. Spirituality, philosophy, and science were once fields that were intertwined, but over time, they diverged. Thankfully, we're returning to a time when Western medicine is embracing the ancient healing arts. Medical doctors now regularly prescribe alternative therapies and energy medicine to their patients. But what is energy medicine and how does it work? Renowned energy medicine practitioner, scholar, and founder of the UNOVA Center, Dr. Jill Blakeway, has asked herself these questions too. Jill is a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine and a clinical therapist. The New York Times named her as one of Manhattan's top acupuncturists. As a practitioner, she is known for her intuitive approach to Chinese medicine and her skills as an energy healer. She's documented her findings in her well-known book, Energy Medicine, The Science and Mystery of Healing. Join me for this exciting episode where Jill takes us on a journey to better understand, apply, and explain this powerful healing force that lies within us. If you ever wanted to learn more about alternative therapies like acupuncture, herbalism, and qigong, you definitely don't want to miss this. And please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed our conversation. Hi, Jill. How are you? Hello. I'm so happy to be on your show. I'm well. Yeah, I really appreciate you making the time to be here today to share your expertise on energy medicine, you know, about this, this topic that a lot of people consider to be kind of esoteric and mysterious. Well, yes, and that is actually why HarperCollins asked me to write a book about it. Um, my, this is my third book, and I always look at the intersection between science and alternative medicine. And they asked me to write a book for skeptical people about the science that underpins energy medicine and whether it could be measured. So that's what I sent out to do. It's a lovely commission. I got to go all over the world talking to healers and scientists so that I could write this book, Energy Medicine, the Science and Mystery of Healing. Yeah, and I think and now we're seeing more people increasingly um, moving towards alternative, alternative therapy. So I think that this is a really great time to be exploring it and really talking about it in mainstream culture. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to getting more into it later on in this interview. So first, let's talk about you. Um, you are a leading authority on alternative medicine and women's health. And you're very well known for your healing touch. So I'm, a, I'm curious to know, what, when did you realize that you have a passion for this field? Well, I think that happened gradually in some ways. I didn't set out in this field. And I think that's true of a lot of young people. We don't necessarily, you don't necessarily find your path straight away. And I always tell patients of mine who are younger, do not freak out. It's okay. People have second and third careers. But I was working in Key West, Florida, of all places. And I had a long-term chronic health issue that I couldn't get rid of. And a woman in a health food store suggested I go to see an acupuncturist. And I was blown away by how quickly this man helped me. You know, I'd, I'd suffered from something that had gone on for six months and within two weeks I was back to normal. And so that started my passion. And I write about this in my book um, because it's partly memoir. And then I went to acupuncture school and I started doing a master's in Chinese medicine and then I did uh, a doctorate. And acupuncture is energy medicine, but I didn't necessarily lean into that side of it. I worked in a hospital when I first graduated graduated. I very much wanted to integrate. I wrote my first book with a Western doctor. You know, I wanted acupuncture to be part of the mainstream. And I think a lot of us of my generation, I've been in acupuncture for 25 years, amazingly enough, um, uh, felt like that. But the truth is that we are a form of energy medicine. And as I started to practice, things started to happen to me that I couldn't explain. I started to feel energy coming out of my hands and patients could feel it. And they were getting 
better. And they would tell me, I think it's, you know, it's that healing touch. It's your magic hands. And I had all the questions I think anyone responsible would have, which is, I know that they can feel this, but what if it's just placebo? What if I have very impressive feeling energy coming out of my hands, but it does absolutely nothing at all, but they're so impressed by it that they self-heal in response to right. it. Yeah. And so that set me off on this journey to find out what is the energy that heals us. Oh, that's interesting. And what made you wanted to explore the scientific side of it? Was it because you were skeptical and you wanted to you know, make sure that what you're feeling has some kind of substance to it, has some logic behind it? Well, the reason I called the book The Science and Mystery of Healing is because I think science is one way of measuring things. Like, is the um, energy that comes out of people's hands measurable? Well, yes, as it turns out, it is. It's a very low frequency, but it's very strong. Um, uh, in Qigong masters, who are very highly trained energy workers, the um, frequency that they emit from their hands is a thousand times stronger than the normally strongest frequency in the body, which is in the heart. Um, so I had those kinds of questions that science could answer. And then there was always a little bit of mystery just outside of my grasp, which I think makes um, it beautiful, actually. And so I didn't attempt to explain some of the more um, uh, unusual things I saw uh, on my journey, although I wrote about them. But a lot of this is measurable. And one of the things that I found out about me, because I was initially trying to explain me to me, was that when I'm with a patient, my heart and my brain go into what's called internal resonance they go at the same frequency and to do that I slow down my brain a lot and I think I just trained myself to do that over time because I really wanted to help the patients but the cool thing is that the patient's heart then goes into the same frequency as mine and at that point they experience genuine peace they always tell me oh my, it feels so peaceful and it's that connection I think that feels so peaceful but I think at that point information gets passed from one person to another and when I looked at research there was research that bore that, that out there's research that shows that people's heart waves start to show up in other people's brain waves when they're talking to each other and at the University of Connecticut they put two people in separate MRIs and when one thought healing thoughts about the other their brain waves synced up um, which is cool that's so interesting <laughs> Is the word for it entrainment? Yes, it is entrainment. Uh, and it's also called um, a, a resonant bond, that you create a resonant bond. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, I've heard that women who live together, somehow their menstrual cycles synchronize. Have you heard of that, that study? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, and that can partially be explained by that, I think, and partially by pheromones and, uh, and other things. But there is no doubt that we communicate with each other in nonverbal ways that could be considered energetic. Okay, okay. That's so interesting. And one of the words that's been used to describe this life force is qi, uh, which is a term from Chinese medicine. Um, how, do you, how would you describe this life force and the role it plays in our energetic makeup? Yes, I think it can sound very esoteric, but actually here's how I explain it to my patients. You're not just skin and tissue and bone. And all the bits of you that aren't skin and tissue and bone are in fact what I would call energy. So in part, it's your memories and your feelings and your thoughts. There's, they're all part of you, but they're not physical. But, and more importantly, I think in some ways, it's also all the ways your body is intelligent. It's the stuff we take for granted. Your body keeps bringing you back into balance unless for some reason it can't. So if you have a couple of extra drinks at dinner, as long as you don't do it every night, your liver will sort it out. If you get a bug bite, you'll have a histamine reaction. Your body behaves intelligently the whole time. And in fact, most of the decisions the body takes are outside of your mind. They're autonomic. Your brain takes all sorts of decisions that you never have to think about, metabolic and um, cardiovascular and reproductive and respiratory. Uh, and so that is what I would call your body's intelligence. The fact that every cell knows who it is and what it is and what it's supposed to do. Every organ system synchronizes its efforts with other organ systems in your body. That is a form of consciousness. It requires awareness 
and a, a response, an intelligent response. So I tell my patients, your chi is your body's intelligence. And it's the bit of you that brings you back into balance. And energy medicine describes all those ways of prompting your body's intelligence to come back into balance, to do something it already knows how to do. How interesting. And what is the relationship between chi and the soul? It's a complicated question. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm happy to answer it or attempt yeah. to answer it. Um, uh, if you think of your chi as all the parts of you that are not physical, then um, this consciousness that is able to recalibrate you and keep bringing you back into balance um, is in all probability bigger than you. Yeah, that, uh, that we are little individuated physical beings on the earth, but we have a consciousness that at some level is shared. And that, I think, is your soul. It's, your, it, it, it's the consciousness in your body that is bigger than you, that is, that is part of our collective consciousness. And at that level, we are not um, separate at all. We are in fact not individuated. So it's also the part of you that isn't individuated. I think it's the part of you that is part of a much bigger matrix of information and energy that we all live in that the ancient Chinese called the Tao. So where do our thoughts and emotions fit into all this? Like what impact do they have on our, on our life force? Well, they have quite a, a lot of impact. It, it's, it's really, as I said, it's part of your energy field because they're part of the intangibles. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not uh, your thoughts aren't controlling the autonomic decisions in your body, but mm -hmm. your thoughts are part of your energy field. So you can use part of your energy field to influence other parts of the energy field. And because of that, I wrote a whole chapter on placebos because um, in science, particularly, and I've done scientific research, we behave as if the placebo is the enemy because we're always trying to beat it to prove that something works. But actually, placebos are really interesting. And they're not what people think they are. They're not just you think about something and then you feel better. You can, your mind can change your body chemistry. So for instance, to give yeah. you an example, at the University of Turin, they took Parkinson's patients who need dopamine. They gave them saline and told them they were getting dopamine. And they produced their own dopamine in response to the suggestion. Now that is your mind affecting your body's intelligence in a, in a really profound way. Um, so I, at the moment, I'm treating my patients on Zoom and I use their mind to move chi, move energy in their body. And I get similar results to the results I would get if I was giving them acupuncture because I can use one part of the energy field to affect another part. That's interesting. And how would this play out in a negative manifestation? Like what if we're feeling stressed out or we're upset? Um, how would that impact us? It's a really good question. There is a thing called the nocebo effect. Um, and you know how if you think you're going to catch a cold, you start to feel sick. <laughs> if you're with someone who has a cold and then you think, I think I'm getting a cold. Yes, my throat's sketchy. Especially now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially now. Um, so you can um, make yourself sicker with your mind too. And we have to be careful. And we also can communicate negativity with our minds. And in my book, I looked at um, some studies from Princeton University from the engineering department of Princeton. And I was imagining that they're the least woo department of Princeton, the engineering department, because they literally make machines. But they had a female grad student back in the 70s who wondered if she could create a machine that could be moved by the human mind. Mm -hmm. And um, the head of engineering, the dean of engineering, Dr. Robert Jean, um, uh, didn't think for a moment she'd be able to pull this off, but he thought it would be a good grad student project. Uh, but she did. She created something called a random event generator, which thanks to decaying atomic material spits out random numbers and what she found was that when someone focused on it with feeling the numbers became statistically less random but when lots of people focused on it with the same feeling they became statistically 
um, less random in a way that was impossible, that was statistically impossible. And so um, what that means, I think, is that um, when we gather together with the same feeling, if we can change a machine, we can change other parts of our physical reality. And the reason this is important is that they have carried on with this research since the 70s and they've, they've created portable random event generators and they've taken them everywhere from yoga retreats to the Trump inaugural. And what they found is that love and compassion and kindness connect us the most and they make the most effect on the, uh, on the machine. But coming up right behind is fear and cruelty. And so we have to be careful because um, our fear um, makes us, it's a very contractive energy. Obviously, if you're scared, you start to contract. Um, cruelty is very contractive. It's not expansive and including. And it spreads like a virus from one person to another. And so um, uh, that means we have to be careful what we think and feel because we can start to affect our reality. Right. And wasn't there a Japanese scientist who studied the impact of emotions on water and la uh, large body bodies of water? I forget what it's called. I think it's called a shape of water or something like that. Yes. Are yes. you aware of that? Yes, Dr. Emoto. Um, Emoto, that's right. Other yeah. people who have done these studies too, um, where they they um, transmit feelings to water and the water changes its character right. when the crystal. And yeah. the crystals um, uh, uh, become different when examined under a microscope. We are undoubtedly communicating with the world around us on an energetic level. And I, I make a case for that in energy medicine, that that can now be measured. Okay. Um, and I think this is especially important for people to know now, because we're living in such scary and uncertain times, do you recommend any tools or practices that people can use to kind of stay balanced? Yes, I do. I think um, obviously politically we're living in very scary times and we need to understand that um, fear is very motivating. So politicians use it, you know, to uh, if you're furious, you get to the polls and um, and, you know, that's true on both sides. Um, so being inflamed is part of this. And actually, I think anger is a righteous emotion. Sometimes I think it's something that changes the world. I think great social change comes when people say enough enough of this um, kind of thing. So it's not necessarily a contractive energy. It could be expansive. But I think we have to be careful about disdain and contempt. I think that's a very contractive energy. Um, and um, as we said, um, I believe our souls uh, are not separate. You know, we're not, uh, we literally are each other at some level. That's why these Princeton studies get the results they get. That's why I can heal my patients um, and our hearts go into um, the same frequency and develop a resonant bond. So um, contempt almost always comes from an ego illusion um, of a separate self, which is in fact a, a delusion at some level. So I don't think um, we should all la la and spiritually bypass and not be angry <laughs> um, at all, because I think um, uh, we should be using um, our energy to affect change, but we need to watch out for contempt and disdain. And I think it's easy in these times where we're so polarized to get into that. Okay, and by contempt and disdain, do you mean judging other people and looking down on people in as general. versus them yes yes yeah. the these people do this the you know that kind of thing um uh, uh i i think it's about judging them as opposed to getting angry about policy and you know the ne the necessity for change i think right. we all rivalry like yeah. yeah, we need a more equal and just world. I think um, so many of us believe that and that that would be worth fighting for and that we should fight for that. It, um, but um, I think we need to be careful about contempt because it separates people in a way that never gets anything done. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the voters on the opposite side, and I don't know your politics, but um, <laughs> although <laughs> in my world I can almost guess, um, but yeah. you think about how um, they react to the feelings of contempt, you know, that the, the idea that um, uh, the other side have contempt for them. It doesn't make them reconsider their position. It entrenches their position. It hurts them. 
it makes them feel small and they come from that place with great anger and resentment mm -hmm. and frustration. Uh, and so I just think that um, if you view the world energetically, um, expansive energies move um, uh, mountains, in fact, metaphoric mountains, contractive energies just keep everybody stuck. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, so how does these healing modalities like acupuncture, herbalism, and Qigong, how does it, uh, is it, is it helpful for people suffering from particular medical conditions? Does it, does it help with the healing process? Yes. And, um, and some things it doesn't help with. Like if you broke your leg, you wouldn't go straight away to your acupuncturist. You would go and see an orthopedist and have your leg set. Yeah, that would just make sense. If you were having a heart attack, you would call an ambulance, go to the hospital. You wouldn't think, oh, I must ring my Reiki healer immediately. Although you might at some point call your Reiki healer. So acute traumatic um, uh, disorders are often better handled with Western medicine. Um, because it's very dynamic and it's forceful and it takes charge. A lot of the alternative modalities are really about prompting your body's own healing response. And what I find is that it's particularly good for chronic issues that are about imbalance. So, you know, for example, autoimmune issues. So really your immune system, which um, should be more intelligent than that, losing its path. And I always, uh, particularly in these days where we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, people talk a lot about boosting your immunity, mm -hmm. but actually a healthy immune system is flexible. And in fact, with COVID, we've seen that some people who have died have died because their immune system overreacted and started to attack their organs. So um, what you need is a very smart, flexible immune system that knows how much to fight to fight off a pathogen and when to withdraw. And that requires intelligence. That's your body's intelligence. And our bodies do this the whole time. They do that the whole time. So people with autoimmune diseases often have a, a, a very embattled immune system that carries on fighting uh, for longer than it should. Allergies, digestive problems, headaches are often chronic imbalance. And Chinese medicine um, is particularly good at prompting the body's ability to heal itself with both herbs, which are quite gentle and natural, but very potent, and, and acupuncture and massage and things like that. So um, it's, it's really worth finding a good practitioner of Chinese medicine if you have something that's been going on a long time, a bit like what happened to me when I came in, you know, discovered Chinese medicine, and is really about imbalance in your body, particularly imbalance between different systems. You know, the way the, the digestive system affects the reproductive system system. Um, Chinese medicine practitioners have many solutions for that, that Western medicine doesn't because they've never, that's not an important focus for them. Okay. And does living a healthy lifestyle support your, your life force? Yes. Yes. In traditional Chinese medicine, it's always said you're born with a certain amount of prenatal qi. And this is really a, a, a very early uh, look at epigenetics. In fact, the modern science of epigenetics, which is that you're born with genetic tendencies to things. Um, uh, but that gene may or may not be switched on depending on lifestyle. Well, the way that that was said before the ancient Chinese knew <laughs> that um, about genes was you're born with a certain amount of qi from your parents and then you can supplement it with lifestyle or or um, use it up um, so the way you pay in is to get good sleep and not to um, uh, stress the whole time you know to come back from stress quickly which is a skill a learned skill um, uh, and um, to eat nourishing foods and all of that supplements the chi you were born with and so the Chinese would say that, or the ancient Chinese as part of Chinese medicine said that you were born, some people were born with more chi than other people. Um, uh, you know, not everybody was born with the same amount of um, uh, prenatal chi. Oh, and that's so, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Which Does is that depend on your parents? Oh. Yes. Um, uh, it, it was said that if you were like the fifth child, your mother's chi was exhausted by that point. Oh. Yep. 
and uh, it sort of reflects the health of your parents, which I, one of my specialties is, is treating fertility. And my first book was called Making Babies. And yeah. so I treat a lot of couples who are trying to have a baby. And I always say, you're passing on your genetic inheritance. It's worth taking three months to get yourself in great shape, not just to have a healthy pregnancy, but to pass on healthy chi um, uh, to your child. Okay. That's really interesting. I never, I didn't, I didn't even know if that, that that happens. That's so interesting. Okay, Jill, this has been tremendously insightful. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to connect. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for asking such interesting questions. Nobody's asked me about the soul before, and I'm really <laughs> grateful that you did. <laughs> So before you go, um, is the best place to learn more about you and your services um, the Unova Center webpage? Yes, um, there are three Unova Centers in New York and we're, we're open. There's a big team. Um, and uh, if you just go to Unova, Y-I-N-O-V-A center.com, you yeah. will find us. You can book um, virtually with me online. You can book in person if you're in New York with our team. And um, you can also find out about energy medicine there, although it is available to all good bookshops and online. Energy medicine, the science and mystery of healing. And also for fertility issues, right? Because I believe you're called yeah. the fertility. We do a lot of or something. Like that. <laughs> we do a lot of re we do we treat everybody from tiny babies to um, senior citizens, but we're known for our ability to deal with hormonal problems and fertility. So we're great for PMS and um, menstrual cramps and PCOS and things like that, as as well as people trying to get pregnant. Okay, wow, that's, that's great. Jill, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Thanks so much again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. Take care. Take care. Bye.